Hello, my name is Craig Steinmoss. I'm a uh, associate professor of epidemiology at the University of California, Berkeley, and I've been a member of the Superfund program here for about the last 12 years. And I'm going to talk about our arsenic and cancer study in northern Chile. Uh, first, I'll talk about sources of arsenic exposure. There's a variety of sources of exposure here in the United States. We can get arsenic through food, um, rice, chicken. We can also get it if we work with arsenic occupationally. There's also arsenic in soil in certain areas. But by far the most common source of arsenic contamination worldwide and here in the United States is arsenic from naturally contaminated drinking water. And millions of people have arsenic in their drinking water worldwide. Tens of millions of people in Bangladesh, West Bengal, millions of people in South America, Europe, and here in the United States. This slide is from the United States US EPA, or US EPA and it shows uh, some of the areas that have arsenic exposure in, in the drinking water. These are public drinking water supplies, and you can see the red dots are areas that have high arsenic levels. This is a, a result of a study that we did in western Nevada on p private drinking water supplies. And we actually had arsenic levels in over 5,000 different wells in western Nevada, private wells. And you can see some of the levels are very high, including um, 70 wells that were over 1,000 micrograms per liter. The US drinking water standard is 10 micrograms per liter. So this is over 100 times higher. But you can see the large number of wells at drinking water levels close to 1,000 or, or above 10 micrograms per liter here in the United States. So this is a topic that's relevant, not just worldwide, but here in the United States as well. Now, the importance of these exposures are they have been associated with a variety of different health effects. And you can see arsenic's been linked to cancer, skin cancer, lung cancer, bladder cancer. It's been linked to heart disease. It's been linked to certain skin lesions, reproductive effects, developmental effects, diabetes, and a variety of other health effects. Despite the current research on arsenic and what we know about arsenic and these links to these health of known health effects, there are a variety of questions that still need to be answered. And that's what we're trying to do in our arsenic study in Chile. One of them is, what are the health effects in children? Most of the previous studies have been on arsenic exposures in adults. Uh, but what about children that are exposed? And not only the health effects in childhood, but what about the health effects of people that are exposed as young children or as a fetus in utero? And does that affect their risk of, of health effects later in life when they're an adult? Those questions still need to be answered. And that's what we're trying to do here in Chile. So this is a map of Chile, and you can see it's a long, narrow country. And we do our research studies up in the north, in regions one and two in the northern part of Chile. And it's an interesting area because on the west coast, you have the beautiful Pacific Ocean and these beautiful coastal towns. And on the eastern side of Chile, you have what I would call these beautiful Andes Mountains. But in between, it's dry, dry desert. And some people call it the driest habitable place on Earth uh, it, because it rarely rains there. In certain areas, maybe once every 10 years, you'll get a couple of millimeters of rain. Um, again, very, very dry. And it reminded me of something I recently saw in the news. Uh, these are pictures from Mars. And I can see a, a nice resemblance between Mars and northern Chile. Again, both very dry, very little rain. There's a couple of advantages of studying arsenic exposure in northern Chile as opposed to other areas. One is the fact that it is so dry. Because it's so dry, there's very few individual water sources. Most of the water in northern Chile to the large towns in northern Chile comes from these large rivers that flow down from the Andes Mountains through the desert and out to the sea. And these large rivers are usually diverted to the big cities in the area and used for drinking water. But again, very few individual water sources. This is unlike other areas, including the United States, where there's thousands and thousands of different private wells, public water supplies, and other water sources. Another advantage is that there's a lot of exposure data that's available in northern Chile. We have arsenic concentrations on all the major water supplies for the last 40 years or more. And the the, the advantage of this is that most people live in the cities. In fact, almost everybody lives in the cities. So if they live in the cities, we know what their arsenic level was because we know the arsenic concentration in that city's drinking water supply, and we know that for the last 40 years or more. And that's important because of this concept of latency. And what latency means is that when you're exposed to arsenic, you don't get cancer the next day or the day after or the week after or even the year after. You'll get cancer 20 or 30 or 40 years 
later. So that's important. If we're studying people that have cancer, we don't need to know what their exposure was yesterday. We need to know what it was, again, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And that's the advantage of studying things in Chile, is because we have those data on past exposure. Another advantage is in the largest city in the area, Antofagasta, nearly 300,000 people, there was a very distinct period of very high arsenic exposure. You can see on the right-hand side of this slide, uh, beginning in 1958, a large river was diverted to the city of Antofagasta and used for drinking. And that river had these incredibly high levels of arsenic. Again, 100 to 80, to 80 to 100 times the, the U.S. regulatory standard. And then in 1970, they discovered that there were some health effects from this, these very high arsenic levels, so they installed a treatment plant. So again, we have this very distinct period of high exposure where hundreds of thousands of people were exposed. And that's pretty rare in environmental epidemiology. I can't think of a situation like that anywhere else. Now the advantage of that is it lets us look at a couple of things. One is we can see how long cancer rates last after the arsenic exposures have stopped. In other words, what we did was we went into the study area relatively recently, 2008 to 2010, and we assessed new cancer cases during that period. So we can see if the rates of cancer in this particular area are still high. And again, it's almost 40 years after the exposures have stopped. Another advantage of this particular study area is we can look at people who were born during the high exposure period. In other words, people born from 1958 to 1970. And we can look at their cancer rates now. So we can see if, and those, those people who were born during that particular period will now be age 40 or 50 up to age 60. So we can see if what you're exposed to when you were born does that increase your cancer rates at age 40 through 50s through 60s? And again, I don't know too many studies that have been able to look at that. And we can also not only look at people that were born during the high exposure period, but people that were born well before the high exposure period. So, so those people would have been adults and would have only had adult-only exposure during the high exposure period. So we can compare those two groups. So that's what we did. We went into northern Chile and we did a case control study where we collected information on 302 lung cancer cases, 232 bladder cancer cases, and 123 lung cancer cases, and then a group of 640 randomized controls, and we assessed their drinking water exposures over their lifetime, and information on what we call confounders, other factors that might affect their cancer rates, including smoking, family history, medical history, and a variety of other data, again, on all these, all these subjects. And to do that, we established a pretty complex infrastructure in the study area where we had laboratories, research offices, a research team, and a group of pathologists and, and radiologists in each one of the four major study centers in the study area. That's Arica, Iquique, Calama, and Antofagasta. So a, a very large infrastructure that we had to set up in the study area and in Santiago, as well as here at UC Berkeley in the United States. So that concludes my presentation on arsenic exposure and our study in northern Chile. Um, again, millions of people worldwide are exposed to arsenic. Arsenic can cause some major health effects, including cancer and heart disease, diabetes, and other health effects. And we feel that northern Chile is probably the best place in the world to answer some of the remaining questions on susceptibility, cancer risks, and other factors. Thank you.